The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So this is, a, this is just one person's rendition of a golem. A golem is uh, sort of uh, the slave uh, Rabbi Lowe and, uh, of Prague. And it's a tale of uh, a, an individual made out of clay, a, a automaton made out of clay to carry out the, the duties. But it uh, gets out of control while the good rabbi is uh, uh, at uh, shul and uh, nobody knows how to stop the thing. So it's kind of uh, running around amok. And this is a problem. And, uh, only, only the rabbi knows how to shut it down. Um, and so uh, this is a kind of a, a dominant metaphor for this book, is this, this concept of this, this mechanical entity that we create for our own, uh, to improve our lives. But, uh, you know, improve our lives through doing the chores and, you know, bringing the water up and all these sorts of things. But it's not as simple as just making a lot of these things and just hoping that you know they'll all go out and do, uh, or intending that they'll go out and do everything that we intend them to do, but nothing else, because there are uh, there are tremendous impacts to the use of mechanical devices, and and not just mechanical in the sense of uh, the traditional sense of machine, as Laura says here. The, the concept of machine is changing. The processing of information is uh, a mechanical process. And so machines are beginning to be thought of, uh, or have long been thought of in Wiener's time, as uh, also devices which are electronic, and primarily uh, working through electronic uh, uh, systems. Okay, so uh, this is a little essay uh, that he wrote. It's a very yeasty little book. It's got lots and lots of little topics in it. It's not meant as a uh, uh, technical, although, as, as Laura said, there, there's some things in it that are uh, conceptually uh, uh, a, little more, uh, a little beyond the average reader's uh, but the book itself is really just trying to talk a little bit about technology and the world that we're creating through it. And uh, Wiener was a deeply, uh, he was a thinking person who thought deeply about uh, a whole range of things. And uh, uh, he's a, uh, uh, a key person in the creation of the field of cybernetics. Uh, his book, Cybernetics, uh, which is uh, uh, a, the subtitle you can see, Control and Communication in the Animal and the Machine. So the concept that we can transfer certain sorts of understandings we get from one location to another location is central here. And so we can learn. We can learn about mechanical devices by studying biological entities, and we can learn about biological entities by studying mechanical devices. And the notion of how organisms control themselves can tell us lots and lots of things about how mechanical devices uh, can be controlled and can also be self-regulating. So these are, these are areas that uh, are of, of prime importance to him, and that's sort of in the background of his thinking here, is this whole question of uh, uh, cybernetics and cybernetic control. Uh, so, uh, as Laura said, the, uh, he, he mentions it's a part of the scientists, uh, this is from page five, 
to entertain heretical and forbidden opinions experimentally. I mean, Wiener has a sense of humor, so some of this is, he, he, he says this, you know, uh, for impact, and he's also aware that, you know, it's, it's, there's, there's an element of humor behind this, but uh, the fact is that most people, as he says, when you say, how are machines and, and humans or organisms alike, just say, oh, you, you can't talk about these two. They just, you know, don't, they're entirely different uh, uh, realms, and any comparison is going to be superficial. And so, uh, and, and sometimes people make these statements on sort of religious grounds. And so that's why he says, uh, entertain heretical. Well, in science, uh, I mean, heresy doesn't really have a whole lot of meaning in science. If, if there's a theory to be considered, uh, then it, it should be considered. But uh, in, in traditional uh, religious frameworks, sometimes uh, uh, suggesting things such as evolution or the similarity between humans and machines uh, can be seen as a, a heretical notion. And he says, if we allow heresy to, di to dictate what we study, we're not going to get very far because, you know, we'll just have to take a lot off the table and say, oh, that's just, you know, it's heretical to consider that. So, yes, Darwin, uh, Darwin's work by some, uh, by some uh, thinkers was seen as heresy or, or uh, sort of irreligious and against uh, the whole concept of uh, religious. You, you remember Demia in Hume and what he said, you know, we should not consider these things. We shouldn't even be talking about these questions because it's, it's sacrilegious. We should simply accept that the Creator made the world and the world is a, is a wonderful, marvelous place. It's uh, mysterious how it came into existence and to begin to reason about it and to think about it and to believe that we can understand it, uh, its origins and principles is pushing us into the realm of the Creator. And so uh, that's to me his point. Whereas you remember Cleanthes is, you know, we can do it uh, because these mechanical things that we find out about the, the universe, the world, are things that uh, simply prove the uh, glory of, of God because they're so complex and so beautiful and so intricate. So why not study the mechanical world in order to go from nature up to nature's God? And then finally we have Philo who sort of plays the devil's advocate and he says, well, as long as we're looking at this uh, beautiful, wonderful place, uh, Let's note that it's not exactly as perfect as uh, Cleanthes thinks it is. Uh, things survive, yes, but just barely. And there's a great deal of suffering and a lot of catastrophes, and it's not all made in any sense uh, of, of the word perfection that everybody would agree on. Okay, so. So that's the uh, that's kind of the entree into this work. He wants to Wiener wants to talk about humans and machines, and he wants to talk about some of the ways in which they're parallel, and to find ways in which we can learn from the two regimes by comparing them and studying them. So uh, that's his uh, that's his, his proposition. But he has a lot of warnings along the way. So this is not just to say, oh, machines are these wonderful devices, and the more we have, the, the better it is, and we should just continue uh, without worry. Uh, he's, he's actually looking at the other side and saying, well, yes, our machines are incredible creations, and they have made it possible for us to survive, but we have to be aware that they need they need to be controlled. We need to understand them. We have to understand their impacts. And we can't just expect to keep using them without thinking that, uh, you know, there are going to be some costs. There are costs. 
and that's what he's uh, okay. So the three points uh, as Orb uh, mentioned: uh, machines that learn, machines that reproduce themselves, the two concepts, and uh, machines that perform coordinately with man. These are his key points of uh, uh, discussion. What does learning imply in the way we usually use the word in terms of uh, mental activity? I mean, don't we normally think of learning as some kind of mental activity? Certainly in, in the case of the individual, don't we? I mean, you're learning, you're taking 1801 or 801 or 802 or whatever you're taking. Uh, I mean, your learning is up here, isn't it? So what kind of stretch is it to say that, you know, there's this thing called phylogenetic learning? Huh. I think maybe he's referring to the type of learning um, where, like, the knowledge that is taken on persists in to like future generations because what we learn as individuals unless we somehow have an impact on society <coughs> is kind of irrelevant because eventually if it's just in our minds we're going to die and there's going to be no like learning of the species so it's what we learn as a species and what we communicate to others and it gets passed on I guess that he's talking about in the sense of like phylogenetic learning. Okay. There are a lot of parallels here that you're you're bringing up. Uh, yes. Craig. Uh, well I was going to say like in like in a phylum there's not one specific one entity that's learning. It's kind of taken as a whole class kind of right. shifting towards the toward the new trend. Mm -hmm. And so it's, there's no there's no, it's not like something's actually getting smarter. It's just through trial and error that okay. Mutations are working better. It, it sort of goes back to the ship metaphor. You know, somebody learned how to make a very complicated clipper ship that you know you can send out across the oceans and uh, go off to wherever. Uh, that learning process somehow got expressed in the physical object of the ship. The ship is a kind of a, a treatise, if you will, of based on the learning of many, many different individuals that went into the creation of this this very complex organism. Charles. Well, I think the learning that that he's referring to here has more to do with the learning of babies than the learning that we do in school, like now. Like for babies, just getting to know the world, it's like they'll try something and like that's where the parents' role is, is like if they do something that they're not supposed to do, then they get, I guess they may get punished and then so they know by trial and error what not to do and what you can do. And so in terms of like a, in terms of like a whole race or like a whole species, if you think about every single individual as a new idea, then you have all these new ideas that like they're just trying to figure their way around the world and whichever new ideas don't work yeah. don't get passed on and the new ideas that do work become like become like just knowledge right like you know it's right mm -hmm. and then so you follow it's kind of like science like you try this it's not right you try this this is right then I take my next step further and the next step further in this sense would mm -hmm. just be the yeah just all right uh any other yes Devin. We can raise the level of abstraction, though, and we can, as in any field of engineering, draw a black box around anything, whether it be a human being mm -hmm. or a society or whatever you want. And you know, there's that there's that adage that the definition of irrationality is continually doing the same thing, expecting different results. So when you think of something like a function, which maps a bunch of inputs to a bunch of outputs, no matter what you do, you always give it the same thing. It's always going to give you the same result. But the difference in any kind of learning system, whether it be a phylum or an individual, is that as you give it a time series, you know you throw all this data information experiences at it, it will slowly fine tune its performance over time so that the outputs will change and hopefully stabilize. And that's where the learning comes in. And I think what he's getting at there is that that same kind of idea of a black box with input and output, where the output is being fine tuned as a result of the, the relationships between the inputs, is a general idea. It's not just about people. It, 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 it scales 
infinitely well. And that's one of the remarkable things about cybernetics mm -hmm. as a field. Yeah. Yeah. Well put. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's this, this, this process of learning that is iterative. And all these iterative, uh, the, the, the power of Darwinian natural selection as an idea is this constant, con this concept of the constant input and output, which in the case of an individual organism is simply uh, reproduction. Reproduction, passing on of uh, certain kinds of uh, traits, remember unity of type, and also the fact that there is variation, which these two facts uh, uh, Wiener mentions in, in the book as salient points in evolution. And so uh, in phylogeny, the expression of the learning takes what form? Well, physical features of the organism. I mean, the, uh, the adaptability of, uh, say, an, organ, an organism in terms of the eye, eyesight. I mean, that's... So when, he, when he's talking about phylogenetic learning, he's really talking about that, that kind of process that delivers a, a higher and higher functioning eye. And its interaction with the environment becomes... Uh, more and more refined. And so it's a physical expression. Back to the ship. It's, a, it's an expression of, of, of physical interaction with environment in a, a space, a niche. And higher, higher levels of performance there would be, in Wiener's terms, phylogenetic learning. This is what delivers these complex organisms that are adapted to their environments. Okay, so all this is based on this this kind of Darwinian iteration process of uh, basically information out, information in, and information out, uh, and a certain amount of change taking place, and the new entity that has inherited the information of the last the parent entity either functions better uh, or it doesn't. But uh, it's, it's basically going to be tested. Each generation is going to be tested for the ability to uh, survive. And so this is uh, a model that he's using for uh, machine learning, too, when he talks about machine learning. And he talks about, as Laura mentioned, uh, in terms of tic-tac-toe, these little systems that uh, can be uh, played with, a, with a, a computer and can actually be uh, uh, subject to improvement. They get better. And so there's a, what he calls a criterion of merit that actually is a uh, element in the selection process. And as this uh, improves, it becomes uh, the, the, the form that gets uh, transmitted. And so this, this sort of process is, uh, is, is key. All right, so... <clears throat> All right, and he also brings up this question of uh, how different are, bio, are, are biological or, organisms and uh, mechanical processes. And his, uh, one, of his, one of his major points is that uh, at the level of reproduction, what is human reproduction? What is any kind of biological reproduction? It's, I mean, of course, he knows a lot more. You can see, you know, what's happened. Mendel has been there, you know, and, and you know, he's way down the line now here from Darwin. Uh, it's well known that uh, there's a whole process taking place here. And for all intents and purposes, it's primarily a process of uh, pattern 
and patterns superimposition on other uh, and, and the creation of new patterns from old patterns. So he says here on page uh, 28, behind all this fantastically complex concatenation of processes, he's talking about biological reproduction here, lies one very simple fact, that in the presence of a suitable nutritive, nutritive uh, medium of nucleic acids and amino acids, a molecule of a gene consisting itself of a highly specific combination of amino acids and nucleic acids can cause the medium to lay itself down into other molecules which either are molecules of the same gene or of other genes differing from it by relatively slight variations. So there's a basically a pattern uh, process of repetition and replication at the core, at the center of biological reproduction. What do you think of that? <laughs> well, well, you know, there are other things in the book that make us, you know, sound like uh, we should be beyond machines too. But, you know, at, at the heart, at the heart, you know, we, we yeah, again, we're, this is in the spirit of Norbert Wiener. We we need to put aside our our biases and our, and you know, if we really want to understand something. It's not to say that that's all, but at least understand that at, at the core that, you know, there are certain kinds of patterns and similarities. Uh, I mean, we could say, well, you know, this is, this is making us into, let's, let's just forget about this field, <laughs> go away and, you know, make better cars or something, you know, but here we are. Every time the segment's been, I don't. What's, what's the problem with being a machine? What's the where's the where's the real breakdown? I mean, I guess I'm pretty naive in that I didn't grow up in a religious household and I wasn't surrounded by religious people. So for me, it's hard for me to grasp exactly what what that influence means. And because if you're a machine, you know, there's still the human use of human beings. You're not being devalued in any way. I don't. I don't see what. And I'm just curious to get other people's perspective on that. Yeah. Good question. Good question. Good question. Oh. Well, I think that um, it's like <clears throat> the machines that we've all grown up knowing don't have a mind of their own, and so they're mindless. And like maybe if you can say that, oh, they function and they come alive, but then if you say that they're alive, their life is basically meaningless because it's, it's it hasn't got any freedom of its own. And so I like, just I think it's just growing up with technology like that, that you are afraid that if your life is just like that of a machine that we have today, mm -hmm. which are our machines are rather rudimentary, mm -hmm. then like our lives would just be meaningless, and mm -hmm. that's a that's like a pretty terrifying concept okay. to grasp. I think. Interesting. Good points. Yeah. Okay. Uh, kind of going off of that, I think uh, machines lack the like element of life. I mean, that's not obviously not a great way of saying it, but they don't have, uh, they, they're artificial, they're everything, I, you know, an ideal machine would give you this response all the time when you put this stimulus or give it this question or whatever, it's going to give you the same thing each time for the same mm -hmm. uh, stimulus, whereas a human, I, th I say, Hi today, you say hi. Tomorrow you say hey. The next day you say hello. It's got that degree of variability. Or one day, if you're pissed off at me, you might ignore me and just blow me off completely. And I think uh, the idea of being a machine and taking away that humanity of it is distasteful to some people. And that's why I don't think it necessarily has to do with religion. It's just personally, I wouldn't want to be so just set in stone, so artificial, so. You do this, I do this. You do this, I do this. You do this, I do this. I'd rather have. I think it's more appealing to have the degree of variability mm -hmm. rather than just the. Uh, I'm just going through my program. This stimulus means I have these three options. This one is this. This one is this. This one is this. I'll select this one rather than mm -hmm. being able to do whatever I want with it. Good point. Yeah. I think the problem religious people have with it is that 
Essentially, I think a lot of religions say that, you know, humans are not just a body, they're a body and a soul. Mm -hmm. And when you can reduce a human down into all these little mechanical bits, and mm -hmm. that's all that it is, it's kind of saying that humans don't have that extra spiritual bit, mm -hmm. that we're just purely machine. And I think that's what starts to bother people, because then they say, well, right. do we have a conscience, or is it all mechanical? Yeah. Is there, are we something else, like... Yeah. Is, it, is, it, is there meaning in life as opposed to, is it just some kind of iterative uh, replicant uh, process that uh, has no deeper meaning? And humans, of course, they thirst for some, you know, for meaning in their lives. But, you know, there may be ways in which, you know, <coughs> these are, I mean, to say that at the core, things are mechanical is not necessarily to take away, you know, the the ability of people to find value in their, their lives and, uh, you know, we're very complicated entities. But at the core here, as he's pointing out, there there's some kind of mechanical process that basically shows that, you know, there are a lot of parallels at certain levels between humans and machines. And what is the purpose of trying to search for this? The cyberneticist says, well, we can learn from this process. We can learn something about all kinds of phenomena in the physical world. And we can learn things about humans, too. So there's the knowledge, the person in search of knowledge wants to understand more deeply the mechanical processes at the heart of all phenomena, whether mechanical uh, machines or humans. But then a lot of it depends, as Devin says, how, how far you want to go in the abstraction and where you want to take it. But uh, certainly he's, for his purposes, he's laying down something, uh, some very important principles here. Other thoughts on this? Yeah. So yeah, kind of along with what Evan was saying, and like you were saying how people have sort of, like people have a thirst for a, finding a meaning of life, finding a meaning to their lives. And I think that like with computers, the thing is that we know everything about them. They are so complex, so beautiful mm -hmm. in terms of what we have created so far. But like we know every single thing about them and there is no... There's no magic in there. Like if we found a computer and we learned how to use it without understanding how it worked, there would be some some sense of magic in there. And I think it's that sense that like the more science develops, like the more we know about how we work, the more the less like un, the less mystery there is in there. And like since ancient times, people have been kind of relying on this mystery, this like this mysterious and unknown. Um, like factor like how life works is so complex, we don't understand it, it must be God, and maybe there's heaven, maybe there's hell. The more science advances, the less of that there is, the less room is, there is for that, and so I think that's why we don't want to associate ourselves with like machines, because like, we know every single thing about them, and eventually, maybe that's what science is going to do to humans, like we'll know every single thing about how humans work, and all the possibilities there are, and then that would leave no space for mm -hmm. Like spiritualism. I mean, keep keep in mind, uh, he's at the he's at the core of cybernetics. So he's you know he's one of the key people in the field, not the only one, but uh, he's a really important thinker. Um, they do have a pretty big exhibit, I think, at the MIT Museum. When I went last year, when I came here mm -hmm. on cybernetics and how they're like trying to build this robot that can actually see and mm -hmm. like people are trying to make human machines a little weird, but... Yeah. So yeah. what is the... Uh, why, why? Why do you think that is? Why is it weird? Why are we trying to... What's driving, you know, all this new knowledge and machine learning and all the... and, and the effort to create uh, sort of uh, uh, higher and higher functioning uh, computational devices and to merge them with physical devices? What is it? <laughs> I think it's a search for understanding. 
So yeah. why we're trying to make uh, something that can think the way a human does, because especially mm -hmm. in high high end uh, mathematics yeah. and uh, physics, they use complex models mm -hmm. to model uh, even more complex system. If we we obviously clearly don't understand the brain very well at all mm -hmm. in terms of cognition and thought mm -hmm. and the way that things. But if we can create a program, say, that moderately closely mimics what's, mm -hmm. what a human can do, we can say, all right, well, we don't know exactly how it works, but this is a really good baseline or a rough mm -hmm. estimate of how it works. So that's how we're trying to understand yeah. cognition. Humans are so natural questers for knowledge, more and more deeper understanding of the world. And far. I think it's so it's like just basic curiosity of humans and also it's like why do humans climb Everest because they can right so I think it's just humans that can get farther and farther and see how much they can do yeah I mean if, if, if you're in a specific area of inquiry uh, deeper and deeper understanding of it is, is it's it's a natural human impulse and, uh, well, according to Wiener, there are other there are other drives. Um, um, I mean, Wiener is tremendously upset by nuclear uh, uh, the technology that led to nuclear weapons. This this deeply, profoundly upset him because he was worried that. Um, in, in creating these entities, the control of them, they had simply raised the level and challenge of controlling them and, and put this challenge in front of humans. And he was, he was very, very concerned about the human ability to stand up to that uh, demand of, uh, of, of control. So uh, Wiener did not work on this technology. Uh, uh, my understanding is that he was invited to and, cult and, and cultivated and refused to, uh, and partly because of his understanding of uh, the problems of control and how do you control these things when you create them. So at the, at the core of this, of this book is this terrible problem of the control of uh, technologies that uh, were probably exhilarating to develop at, you know, at a theoretical level. I mean, to solve the problems and to create the entity was a huge rush for a lot of people who were incredibly bright, talented, and at the top of their fields. And yet, to create it, once it's created, you have to control it. So that's why these little tales of you know, the, uh, you know the, the sorcerer's apprentice and the monkey's paw keep coming back up in this piece. And this is not he's he's not raising this from you know he's not against but he's not raising this from a humanistic point of view so much as from a technical point of view of the control of the things that you create. I mean, who thought that uh, at, at that time that, you know, we would be dealing with uh, a world of, uh, you know, proliferating uh, atomic uh, weaponry, uh, you know, almost 70 years later with, you know, this technology, you know, a lot of different people uh, made use of it. And so the nuclear club, club grew, and uh, he was aware of this set of problems. And, but this is not what people were thinking about when they were creating the original technology. So that's, that's, that's a deep problem. It's just, you know, what are the impacts? What are going to be the costs? I mean, other examples he brings up in the, in the book. Uh, I didn't, we didn't read the whole book, but later in the book, he, he brings up even things like health care. I mean, we can create tremendous medical technologies, but how do we deal with the 
you know, the, the population explosions or the extension of populations. He's not saying we shouldn't do them, but what he is, he's, he's saying, you know, as you apply all these different technologies, you're going to have other, other problems that you're going to have to solve. And, you know, it's, 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 it's a complex set of questions. I mean, no, no one would, uh, <coughs> certainly not Wiener would say, well, you shouldn't, you know, uh, uh, improve, uh, you know, uh, you know, delivery, uh, birth deliveries among all the popular, I mean, he would be, you know, he's, a, he's a, a definitely a, a humane individual who would be for, all technologies that could improve human conditions. But what he's saying is there are going to be a lot of other challenges that are going to come along with these. And so, you know, so then he, uh, <clears throat> okay, so he says there are certain, there are certain types of individuals he calls gadget worshippers who he, he does, uh, uh, he does fault. And these are people, uh, he says, uh, a person infatuated with the amplica amplification of power and control through technology, as well as the transfer of human functions to machines and unquestioning servitude. So what is this gadget worshiper? Why is it? Why does it emerge in this little book? What's he talking about? Well, certainly at at a certain level, uh, the uses of technology to gain personal ends and to control other people um, and it's it's his it's his argument that there are certain people who are attracted to this some people are attracted to you know power through the manipulation of of uh, technology and that these are people who are uh, a problem because uh, there is in, inherent in some kind of, uh, in, in some way in technology, this, this promise of control. And that's going to draw many different types of people. What one type he talks about as the gadget worshiper. He says on page 54, it is the desire to avoid the personal responsibility for a dangerous or disastrous decision by placing the responsibility elsewhere on chance, on human superiors and their policies, which one cannot question, or on a mechanical device which one cannot fully understand, but which is, has a presumed objectivity. So this he identifies as the motive of gadget worshippers. And uh, they would be uh, people who are interested in making the types of technologies that are uh, give them power over other people. Um, I'm not. I mean, I'm not sure exactly what he's talking about here. I think he's talking mainly about military technologies and things of that sort. But uh, uh, you know, uh, it probably applies to many different regimes, um, and that's why. This leads them into this whole discussion of magic. What is the attraction of magic? Yeah. Okay, okay, we, we can't, can't figure, figure it out. out. What does magic do? Why, Why do people want, want magic? magic? Makes life easier. Okay, magic, magic makes, makes life easier. easier, okay. But isn't there some deeper motive? Human motive? Why have humans always entertained the worlds of magic? And I mean, what is it that attracts humans to magic? David? Uh, well, maybe some people think it sort of suspends the laws of nature. Sort of, it sort of gives like humans that illusion of control. 
Okay. The power. Magic is, is power. Unquestioning power. And it's there. Just, you know, when you turn the switch. So magic is always, uh, you know, it, it's, it's attractive in, in some sense. Uh, maybe not to everybody, but uh, certainly the idea of using magic to enrich yourself or to gain power over other people is an old concept and an and, and, and old uh, human endeavor. And he's arguing here through this gadget worshiper metaphor that in some ways Technologies also offer us a kind of a magical solution to problems. They can. And, you know, gaining that power is, is, is attractive. Uh, so, and, and it also tells us something about the nature of some of these uh, uh, technologies. So then uh, he launches into <coughs> The Sorcerer's Apprentice. What's the story of The Sorcerer's Apprentice? Chris, did you get that? Oh, the monkey's paw. Oh, the, the monkey's paw. paw. What, what about, about uh, he, he, he talks, talks about, about the sources of premise first. Uh, did anybody, you know the t story, don't you? Yeah. Exactly what it uh, goes, but the the apprentice goes and you know is experimenting and makes some kind of disastrous mistake that goes running amok, and eventually the the, the sorcerer has to come back and kind of scold him, slap him across, and wheel everything back in. And right, yeah. is, is that how it goes? Yeah. It's, it's, uh, uh, if, if you saw if you saw Disney, uh, Disney had a version of the Sorcerer's Apprentice. I think I gave you a link and maybe in the syllabus to this little cartoon. But it was uh, the broom and. Uh, the sorcerer knew how to get the broom to go down and fetch water, bring it up. And uh, he had certain language that he, uh, he spoke and the broom would spring into action and go fetch the water. And they, they but he also knew how to stop the broom. <laughs> so he's away one day and the apprentice. The apprentice, yeah, you, you may have seen the Mickey Mouse version, uh, Mickey Mouse, you know. Uh, the, the apprentice uh, knows how to start the broom, and so the broom goes down and starts bringing up uh, the water, but he doesn't know how to stop it. So it, you know, it, keeps, it keeps going, and everything is getting, you know, everything is getting flooded, and uh, it's, it's out of control. So it goes back to that, that old story of the golem, you know, the, the thing that's out of control. And, you know, we know how to start it, we don't quite know how to shut it down. And, you know, are there any, are there any examples of that in modern technology? I mean, I don't have anything specific in mind, but... Well, maybe our automobiles are... <laughs> I mean, you think, uh, how could we shut down, you know, the systems that we built? There are many systems we could not shut down. And they may be, you know, they may not necessarily be taking us in the right direction. I mean, that's not to say that uh, we should uh, abandon them immediately or that they were the wrong things to create. But, you know, are there not areas that we've developed technologically that we now are beginning to wonder, you know, how long can this, you know, and, and how do we stop it? Well, you, it's not quite as easy as just shut it down, but uh, you know there are plenty of technological areas. Yeah. Uh, that <coughs> saying, uh, "How do we stop it?" made me think of uh, the cars, uh, the Toyota cars that wouldn't stop. Actually. Oh right, right. The ones with the cruise oh, yeah. control problem. What people try to stop that, and uh, I mean that's obviously not a really great example, but it yeah, is an yeah, example yeah. Yeah. of uh, technology. And all right, it's doing what we told it to. But now we don't. Yeah, we somehow we. Yeah. Yes, yeah. we could manually open the engine, and like <coughs> start disconnecting things until it turns off. But yeah. it's not really a reasonable option. Okay. The same way, if like a computer starts malfunction, we can unplug it. Yeah. But I mean, what does that do for us? Yeah. 
Yeah, yes. so, uh, I mean, again, this is, a, this is, I mean, he's trying to get people, he's not saying these, you know, technologies are, he's just trying to get people to think more deeply about what they're involved in and not simply look at the surface, but to probe the deeper impact and meaning and to also design, when they do design, to design more thoroughly so that, you know, possible problems are anticipated. Even so, it's unlikely that all the problems will be. Okay, so the monkey's paw, again, uh, the whole tale of, uh, you know, the... Uh, uh, so what is the uh, what is the monkey's paw? He says here on page fifty-eight. Um, in this tale, an English working family is sitting down to dinner in its kitchen. The son leaves to work at a fa factory, and the old parents listen to the tales of their guest, a sergeant major back from service in the Indian Army. He tells them of Indian magic and shows them a dried monkey's paw, which he tells them is a talisman which has been endowed by an Indian holy man with the virtue of giving three wishes to each of three successive owners. This, he says, was to prove the folly of defying fate. Important to remember this, that phrase there, the folly of defying fate. He says that he does not know what were the first two wishes, wishes of the first owner, but that the last one was for death. This should have told him something. He himself was the second owner, but his experiences were too terrible to relate. He is about to cast the paw on a coal fire when his host retrieves it, and despite all the sergeant major can do, wishes for 200 pounds. Shortly thereafter, there is a knock at the door. A very solemn gentleman is there from the company which has employed his son. As gently as he can, he breaks the news that the son has been killed in an accident at the factory. Without recognizing any responsibility in the matter, the company offers its sympathy and 200 pounds as a, as a uh, solatium, as a compensation. The parents are distracted and at the mother's suggestion, they wish the son back again. By now it is dark without, a dark windy night. Again, there is a knocking at the door. Somehow the parents know that it is their son but not in the flesh. The story ends with the third wish that the ghost should go away. The theme of all these tales is the danger of magic. This seems to lie in the fact that the operation of magic is singularly literal-minded, which Laura mentioned, and that if it grants you anything at all, it grants, you, uh, it grants what you ask for, not what you should have asked for or what you intend. So this is his uh, tale, and he, you know, again, he's uh, using this to uh, to suggest that there are many things that uh, we we can develop, and uh, they may not be what we thought they would be. His argument that uh, sorcery is. Uh, uh, is, is in some ways, science is similar in some ways to sorcery. I mean, sorcery is magic. Science is not magic. But there are certain kinds of power that are uh, delivered through the applications of science. And again, his, his, he's, not a, he's not a Luddite or a, uh, I mean, he's at the core of a lot of but what he, what he is saying is uh, we need to think about these. The people who develop it need to take some kind of uh, role in thinking about what its applications will be and what its social impact will be. Uh, they can't simply, they shouldn't simply be the technical people who say, well, it's somebody else's problem. I develop it, but you know, it's not my problem to control it. Uh, he, he's saying that this responsibility extends to the people who make it, who make the, make the technologies. So, so his, uh, I mean, his message is, is also deals with simply the fact that uh, automization 
you know, we are atomizing everything. I mean, for many, many reasons. I mean, we interact now with all kinds of devices and all kinds of processes that have been automated. A goal-seeking mechanism will not necessarily seek our goals unless we design it for that purpose. And in that designing, we must foresee all the steps of the process for which it is designed. That's what I was just mentioning. The penalties for errors of foresight will be enormously increased as automization comes into its full use. So this is, this is again, a, a concern from somebody who's at the core of this process. And this, uh, this is also my favorite quote. The world of the future will be an ever more demanding struggle against the limitations of our intelligence, not a comfortable hammock in which we can lie down to be waited upon by our robot slaves. So he foresaw the weak link here as the human link, the ability of humans to kind of keep up with what's happening and to understand and, and control it and use it wisely. Jake. I think that's really kind of his whole point overall is that uh, the limiting factor is our ability to convey to our machines or robots or artificial intelligence mm -hmm. or software mm -hmm. what exactly we want from it. Yeah. And that's, that's the why there's however many different programming languages. Yeah. There's yeah. different ways to program a different certain yeah. program. Yeah. There's so much variability because there is no perfect and exact yeah. way no. to make it do exactly what we want. We have to kind of no. use work throughs and work arounds yeah. and different things to try to try to get what we want. There's no way to you can't just tell a computer do this and yeah. have it come up with a way to do it. You have to say take this step, this step, if this and that, if the case is this, case is this, case is this, case mm -hmm. else and all sorts of other things, try to get what we want. There's no way to no. just say do it and have it get done. Yeah. Yeah, that's where the challenge is. It's, it's so that's the challenge of design, is, is to understand the design and to see how its expression is ultimately going to ultimately take place and the full range of things. Because there are many, many things that have been designed with perfectly wonderful intentions and uh, that have turned out not to really work the way that we, uh, the designers, intended them to, even though they had the best of intentions. So that's, that's a big, and especially as things become more and more powerful and as computing uh, really magnifies our power. Uh, you know, we are definitely in a, in a more complex world. Okay, you see some of these environments we, we, we live in. Uh, can you imagine being in the space capsule and going off to uh, you know, the moon? <laughs> it's like trying to, you know, some of you may have seen the, the film. Uh, uh, you know, just, just trying to be uh, aware of what's happening in that kind of a system. I mean, humans have really uh, put a, a tremendous challenge to themselves. Okay, so uh, he's a, uh, you know, this is a great little book. Uh, you know, when you get some time, I hope you're saving some of these books that uh, you have the links and things of that sort, because it's definitely worth revisiting this book. It's a wonderful little book. Uh, and uh, in some ways, uh, it was his, his swan song, his message to the world of, uh, from, you know, his accumulated wisdom. Uh, and, uh, you know, a life of uh, incredible achievement.